Welcome back to our journey through the fascinating world of that time I got reincarnated as a Slime's Light novel. Let's continue from the last part where we left. Milam declared war on him in a loud and flamboyant manner, nullifying all agreements between them. Kurilan, now facing the prospect of war, gathered his forces to prepare for the impending battle. Despite his frustration with Milam's reckless actions, he focused on rallying his warriors and formulating a plan. Aware of Milam's formidable power, some of his generals expressed concern, but Carillon remained determined to face her in combat. He acknowledged the danger she posed but saw the upcoming battle as an opportunity to prove his strength. As preparations intensified, Carillon ordered the evacuation of non-combatants and instructed his closest generals to coordinate with Remuru for support. Carillon prepared to fight Milam as she arrived, unleashing powerful attacks that were easily deflected by her multi-layer barrier. Despite wielding his formidable white tiger blue dragon halberd, Milam's Tema sword absorbed every blow. Recognizing Milam's strength, Kurilan transformed into his royal beast form, a majestic fusion of animal traits and equipped with legendary gear. However, even his ultimate attack, Beast Roar, failed to defeat Milam, who countered with her devastating Drago Nova, obliterating everything in sight, including Kurilan's kingdom. As Kurilan contemplated escape, he was confronted by Frey, who swiftly incapacitated him, leading to the downfall of Eurozania on what would be remembered as the Day of Ruin. In the Tempest, long before the Day of Ruin, Emjurin, a magic-born, spied on Rimuru's town under orders from Clayman, her demon Lord Master. She reported extensively on the town's developments, including Milam's friendship with Rimuru and their alliance with the Dryads. Clayman found this surprising, especially Milam's behavior, but Emjurin knew better than to understand Demon Lord's thoughts. She provided Clayman with valuable information and earned his trust, receiving a solo mission in return. Continuing her surveillance, Mjurin observed Milam's cautious actions and decided to infiltrate a group of humans visiting the town to gather more intelligence. Despite Clayman's waning interest in her, Mjurin was determined to secure her freedom and devised a plan to exploit any opportunity for her benefit. Before the Day of Ruin, Mjurin traveled to the Kingdom of Pharmus, following a human party's trail. She marveled at the advancements in human towns, reminiscing about her own time as a human centuries ago. In the Free Guild branch, she encountered a rowdy group of people and caught the attention of a man named Isaac, who tried to flirt with her. Emjurin, uninterested, focused on her mission to join the guild and chose the monster-slaying department to avoid Isaac's advances. After showcasing her skills, she intimidated Isaac into becoming her underling. Later, she successfully infiltrated the guild and awaited the arrival of Yom's team, led by Franz. After saw them, she encountered them and asked if she could join their team. But Yom challenged her in order to prove her strength. Then they went to a quiet forest with only Franz and Isaac watching. Yom, overconfident in his armor, underestimated Emjurin's magic. Despite having some men on his side, he insisted on fighting alone. Emjurin challenged three of them at once, which angered Yom. He ordered his companions to attack, but Emjurin cleverly trapped him in a pitfall using magic. Even with his magic-resistant armor, Yom couldn't escape. Emjurin then silenced his allies with another spell, securing her victory effortlessly. Later at the tavern, Yom admitted his defeat and asked Emjurin to teach them how to fight against magic users. Emjurin couldn't shake the feeling that she was in over her head. She had joined Yom's team to gather information on the monsters in the forest, but now she found herself in a position of authority among them. Despite their obliviousness to her true nature, she found interacting with them strangely enjoyable. She busied herself with advising the team on tactics and teaching them basic magic, all while regretting revealing her magical abilities. The responsibility of casting deciding votes and managing the team's actions fell on her shoulders, adding to her frustration. Yet she couldn't simply walk away from the mission, even as it seemed like a failure. Despite her complaints, she found a sense of fulfillment in the camaraderie and challenges she faced. Eventually, the opportunity arose for the team to return to Tempest, bringing a sense of relief to Emjurin. Grukasith found himself in the middle of intense battle training with Hakuro, an experienced warrior. Despite the painful bruises he endured, Grukasith admired the skill of his teacher. Observing the hobgoblins and goblin riders, he realized the strength and unity of Tempest's warriors. Gabda, his training partner, impressed him with his resilience, while other formidable fighters like Rieger and Geld showcased their power. Grusith couldn't help but feel overwhelmed by the sheer strength of Tempest's residents, including ogre mages like Kurob and Shuna. 
Reflecting on his own abilities, he acknowledged the vast difference in power between himself and the warriors of Tempest. He realized that challenging Tempest to war would be futile, a sentiment echoed by his master, Karalan. Yon's group returned to town, where Grukasith noticed a new woman among them. Curious, he inquired about her, prompting Yon to warn him not to underestimate her. Eager for a challenge, Grukasith agreed to spar with her, unaware of her magical prowess. Despite her warnings, he underestimated her abilities due to his own magical resistance. However, his overconfidence led to his defeat, much to Yom's amusement. Later, Grusith acknowledged his mistake and apologized to the woman, revealing his identity as a lycanthrope and upper-level magic born. Despite their sarcastic exchange, Grusith promised to call Yom boss as per their bet, showing his integrity. He even decided to join Yom's group. As they enjoyed their time together, Gaba approached them with a devious plan to challenge their instructor, Hakuro. Excited by the idea, Yom and Grukasith agreed to help. Reluctantly, Emjurin also agreed, though she had doubts about the plan's effectiveness. Gaba suggested a strategy involving pitfalls, but Emjurin knew it wouldn't work against someone like Hakuro. Despite her concerns, they proceeded with the plan, only to be swiftly defeated by Hakuro's incredible speed and skill. Emjurin observed the battle with magic sense, realizing that conventional magic wouldn't stand a chance against such a formidable opponent. Emjurin had more magical energy than Hakuro, but she knew trying to overpower him physically would be futile. Still, she found some satisfaction in seeing her plan unfold, even though Hakuro focused on defeating Grusit first. She had prepared spells to blind and deafen Hakuro, but he easily shrugged them off with his own magic sense. Feeling insulted by his dismissal of her magic, Emjurin considered using her final spell, Sleep Mist, but seeing Grukith's foolish reaction to her earlier spells drained her will to continue. When Hakuro confronted them afterward, Emjurin acknowledged her failure and resolved to understand her allies better for future endeavors. As they endured Hakuro's punishment, Emjurin vowed never to participate in such reckless plans again. Hakuro warned Gabda and the others not to try any tricks on Sir Rimuru, as they might actually work due to Rimuru's unique abilities. Despite their reassurances, Hakuro expressed concern, hinting at the mysterious nature of Rimuru's powers. The group discussed Rimuru's magic sense and the idea of Rimuru restraining his own strength for training purposes, leading to a new trend among monsters in Tempest. After their muddy ordeal, they decided to visit the town's bathhouse together, where Gabda mentioned a rumor about mixed gender baths, sparking excitement among the group. As they discussed the idea in the bathhouse, their voices carried to the women's bath, where Shuna, Xi'an, and Emjurin overheard their plans with amusement and determination to set things straight. Several weeks into her life with Yom and his crew, Emjurin was approached by Yom for a private conversation. Curious but cautious, she followed him to a deserted patch of forest, worried he might have discovered her true identity. However, to her surprise, Yom confessed his love for her, catching her completely off guard, Unsure how to respond, Emjurin felt a mix of emotions, including anxiety about her past and doubts about a human's ability to love her. Despite her internal conflict, life continued as usual with Yom showing respect for her feelings and refraining from further advances. However, Emjurin found herself conflicted as she began to entertain the idea of being with Yom, despite the seemingly insurmountable obstacles. Unbeknownst to her, Grukasith watched her with a troubled expression, hinting at the impending destruction of their peaceful life within the week. Emjurin received an unexpected message from Clayman, the demon lord she despised. He praised her for her past contributions and hinted at setting her free, which both surprised and worried her. Clayman proposed one final task, subtly threatening the man she cared about. Despite her reluctance, Emjurin knew she had no choice but to comply to protect Yom and herself. She couldn't risk defying Clayman and potentially causing harm. As she contemplated the possibility of freedom and the moral implications of her actions, Emjurin steeled herself to follow Clayman's orders and hope for the best, even though it meant trusting a manipulative demon lord. With her fate seemingly tied to Clayman's whims, Emjurin resolved to wait for her next orders, knowing that her only chance at freedom might come at a high cost. King Edmaris of Pharmus received troubling news about the disappearance of the seal on Voldora, the Storm Dragon leading to increased monster activity and requests for aid from nobles. Instead of helping, Edmaris planned to use the situation to strengthen his authority and save resources by sacrificing frontier provinces. However, 
A new champion named Yom disrupted his plans by defeating an orc lord and reducing monster attacks. Despite doubts about Yom's status as a champion, the government acknowledged the threat was eliminated. Meanwhile, farmers faced a sharp decline in tax revenues due to a decrease in trade and adventurers visiting the kingdom. The discovery of a monster-inhabited town in the forest of Jura further complicated matters, prompting Edmaris to strategize on how to capitalize on the situation for the kingdom's benefit. King Edmaris of Farmus called an emergency meeting with provincial lords to discuss the emergence of a new town in the forest of Jura inhabited by monsters. The town, known as the Jura Tempest Federation or simply Tempest, was led by Rimuru Tempest, a slime. The ministers and nobility were shocked by the news, especially the revelation of a slime being in charge. Among those present was Shogo Taguchi, an otherworlder and champion of Farmus, who expressed disbelief and disdain at the idea of a slime ruling over monsters. However, the discussion continued, revealing that Tempest was home to evolved monsters with demi-human traits, and it boasted a system of substations along the highway to ensure travelers' safety. Shogo and another otherworlder, Kyoya Techibana, questioned the feasibility of monsters serving as sentinels, while Chief Sorcerer Raisin pondered the possibility of an otherworlder influencing events in Tempest. Because of Tempest, there was a big problem. Fewer merchants were coming, and the country was losing money. Then they heard about Forest of Jura, where adventurers were getting monster stuff. This town had good potions and even a blacksmith. What's more, there was a new road to the Dwarven Kingdom. Now merchants could go straight there without passing through Farmus. The king called a meeting to figure out what to do. Nobody had an answer, but they all agreed they needed to do something. They had lots of soldiers, but fighting the monsters would be hard, and if they attacked, they wouldn't get any land from it. So they needed a plan to deal with the monster town and keep their neighbors happy. But nobody wanted to be the one to start the fight. King Edmaris and his advisors were thinking the same thing as the nobles. They knew they had to act fast after hearing about the monster town. They discussed how to deal with it without hurting the kingdom's interests. They agreed they needed to strike now before the Western nations found out. The king's close aide, Raisin, warned that the monsters were a big threat and needed to be dealt with. The archbishop, Rehiem, said the church was ready to help. They planned to use the Temple Knights, a powerful force of fighters. The king smiled, knowing they had the church's support. Now they just needed a plan to get the nobles and mercenaries on board, they decided to promise rewards and glory to those who joined the fight. With the church's backing and the promise of riches, they were ready to attack the monster town and take control of its resources. King Edmaris couldn't wait to be hailed as a hero and gain even more power. The emergency meeting was just a show to make everyone think King Edmaris was reluctantly stepping up to lead. When some nobles raised concerns about attacking the monster town, the king and his advisor, Rahim, assured them it was necessary. Rahim even claimed they had divine guidance to destroy the monsters. This made the nobles uneasy, but they didn't want to go against the church. The king used fear and manipulation to silence any dissent, convincing everyone that attacking the monsters was the right thing to do. He even tricked the nobles into thinking the monster leader was weak and easily manipulated. With the church's support, the king declared it a holy war and ordered an attack. After the meeting, the king and his advisors discussed sending a small group to cause chaos in the monster town. They hoped this would make the monsters surrender without a fight. Rahim even had a secret spell he wanted to try. The king agreed, eager for the glory it might bring. As they plotted their next move, they were filled with excitement and anticipation for what was to come. Following King Edmaris's orders, a team was put together for a special mission. Among them were three people from another world, Shogo Kyoya and Kirera. Shogo complained about being chosen for the mission, wondering if it was really necessary to send such a big force to deal with the monsters. Carrera laughed and teased Shogo about his strength, while Kiyoya tried to stay positive, reminding them of the perks they received for obeying orders. But deep down, all three felt frustrated about being controlled by the locking curse placed on them when they were summoned to this world. Shogo, especially, felt angry and wanted revenge on the person who controlled them. Despite their complaints, they knew they had to follow orders for now. As they set off on their mission, each of them had their own thoughts and hopes for the future, including Kyoya, who saw this as an opportunity to break free from their control. Emjuren received an urgent message from Clayman, instructing her to cast a powerful magic spell to create an anti-magic zone around Tempest. Despite her concerns, she had no choice but to obey. 
However, casting the spell would reveal her true identity as a powerful magic user, putting her in danger from the people of Tempest. Grusith, noticing her strange behavior, tried to stop her, but she couldn't explain the situation to him. She realized Clayman's plan was in jeopardy due to unexpected events involving the demon Lord Milim, and she had to act quickly. As she prepared to cast the spell, Yom, her love interest, appeared and pledged to protect her, regardless of her true nature. Overwhelmed by his sincerity, M. Jurin completed the spell, willing to sacrifice everything to keep Yom safe. The situation in Tempest became even more chaotic as M. Jurin's anti-magic spell neared completion. Benamaru, overwhelmed with reports, learned of a group of heavily armed humans approaching, claiming to be from the kingdom of Pharmus. So I investigated and confirmed their origin, raising concerns of potential conflict. Meanwhile, news arrived from Eurozania about hostilities with the demon Lord Milam, prompting urgent discussions among Tempest's leaders. Before they could contact Rimuru, the humans from Pharmus, now disguised as merchants, arrived, adding to the tension and uncertainty. Shogo and his friends reached a town that amazed them because it was more advanced than their capital. They were supposed to cause trouble there, but they didn't expect the creatures in the town to live better than they did. They planned to stir up chaos by tricking the guards, but things didn't go as expected. When they tried to cause trouble, the townspeople didn't believe them and laughed instead. Then another person named Shuna arrived and stopped them, explaining that they couldn't use their powers in the town. Shuna looked at Carrera with a calm smile and used her power to stop Carrera's attack. She told Carrera to leave the town right away because she wasn't welcome there. Shuna knew Carrera had tried to hurt someone, and she didn't like it. But Shogo and Kiyoya didn't listen and wanted to fight. Shan stepped in to stop them, but they didn't care. They were ready to fight and didn't think about the consequences. Meanwhile, in another part of town, Benamaru tried to contact Rimuru, but couldn't. Then, suddenly, all the magic in the town disappeared, causing chaos and confusion everywhere. Buildings started to collapse, people ran for cover, and the whole town was in trouble. Rimuru felt relieved as he emerged from the magical field and saw Ranga, who had been worried about him. Reflecting on his close call, he realized that his plan to create a copy of himself had saved him from being trapped. He decided to be more careful about hiding his presence and created a mask to conceal his aura. Looking back at the battle, he was impressed by Hinata's power and tactics. He analyzed her skills and realized how dangerous she could be, especially with her disintegration magic. Despite not winning, Rimuru considered his escape a tactical victory and gathered valuable information from the battle. Worried about the town's safety, he decided to check on everyone right away. Rimuru tried to use a warp portal to return to town but found that it didn't work due to a barrier isolating the area. Realizing the danger, he hurried to a cave where Gable and others were waiting. Gable explained that they lost contact with Benamaru and others and suspected that a military force from Pharmus was marching towards town. Suai, who had been injured while trying to escape the barrier, shared his concerns with Rimuru. Rimuru instructed Gable to guard the cave and decided to investigate the barrier himself. Using spatial motion, he and Soai's team bypassed the barrier and entered town. Rimuru analyzed the barrier and instructed Soai to locate its casters without engaging in combat. As they prepared to confront the threat, Rimuru remained cautious, knowing that any mistake could be fatal. In town, Rimuru noticed a barrier preventing magic use but found his multi-layer barrier unaffected by it. Rushing through the panicked crowd, he was greeted by relieved faces, including Rigard and Kaijin, who were hiding their worry. Rigard led him to a meeting room, but Rimuru sensed something amiss and insisted on going to the plaza. Ignoring excuses, he pressed on and heard an explosion nearby, discovering Benamaru in a heated confrontation with Grukasith and his high orcs. Despite Benamaru's overwhelming strength, Grusith persisted in protecting a woman in Yom, prompting Rimuru to intervene before matters escalated further. Benamaru released Grukith upon seeing Rimuru and the tense atmosphere dissipated. After attending to the injured, Benamaru explained how the town was attacked by disguised merchants who wielded unexpected power, followed by the disabling of magic and subsequent chaos. Before Benamaru could finish, Rigard interrupted, hinting at hidden truths. Gel disclosed that Emjurin's magic weakened them, and Yom intervened to protect her, resulting in a conflict. Yom and Grukasith pleaded for understanding, while Emjurin took responsibility for the tragedy, leading Rimuru to a devastating sight, countless monsters lay dead in the plaza. Overwhelmed by guilt and confusion, 
Rimuru grappled with the consequences of his decisions and the turmoil within him, realizing Emjuren's manipulation and the danger of succumbing to rage. With the guidance of the Great Sage, Rimuru fought to maintain composure and seek a resolution without further harm. After deciding to relocate, Rimuru asked Rigard about other victims, learning that Lady Shuna was attending to them elsewhere. Rigard explained that despite some injuries, there were surprisingly few casualties due to the formidable attackers. The meeting convened and Rimuru received a briefing on the recent events, feeling detached as he processed the shocking information. The attackers targeted Gabzo initially, exploiting his vulnerability, but Gada intervened, escalating the conflict. Hakuro and Gada were injured during the skirmish, revealing the attacker's strength. Rigard recounted how a group of knights from Farmus joined the fray under false pretenses, attacking both monsters and residents. Rimuru realized the potential threat posed by Farmus, considering their greed and desire to control the trade route. Merchants and adventurers from Blumand offered insights, prompting Rimuru to advise their return home to prevent them from becoming pawns in Farmus's propaganda. He assured them safe passage and made preparations for their departure. After being briefed by Rigard and Benamaru, Rimuru decided to talk to M. Jurin to understand her involvement. She confessed to being controlled by a powerful demon named Clayman, who used her to spy on their nation. M. Jurin explained that she was one of Clayman's puppets, unable to defy his orders due to a skill called Marionette Heart. She revealed Clayman's plan to block magical communication and his intentions to manipulate a conflict between Tempest and Farmus. Rimuru realized they were in a difficult situation and couldn't afford to involve other nations. He decided to postpone judgment on Emjurin and instructed Yom and his group to remain confined to their rooms. Despite Yom's pleas, Rimuru knew he needed time to figure out the best course of action. After finishing up with the visitors from Blumund, Rimuru led them outside of town, unable to provide guards due to the magic barrier. Determined to help them leave safely, Rimuru used his magic to create a pathway to the outskirts of Blumund. Everyone was surprised by this display of magic, but they followed Rimuru's instructions without question. Rimuru asked them to keep his magic a secret and promised to support their cause as much as possible. However, he didn't expect much help from them, knowing that their nation couldn't do much to intervene. Rimuru was focused on dealing with the kingdom of Pharmus himself, feeling responsible for the harm caused by the recent attacks. Watching the visitors leave, Rimuru decided to assist Shuno with the wounded. He found Hakuro and Gabta in the hospital, badly injured from the recent attack. Rimuru tried using potion on them, but it didn't work, as the wounds were caused by a special skill. Despite his injuries, Hakuro remained optimistic, reassuring Rimuru that he would heal in time. Rimuru then used his powers to help Hakuro recover. Meanwhile, Gabba suddenly jumped out of bed, surprising everyone. Rimuru noticed Xian was missing and became concerned when nobody would tell him where she was. Eventually, Benamaru led Rimuru to find out the truth about Xian's whereabouts, leaving Rimuru anxious as they headed off to find her. As they reached the central plaza, Rimuru found Xian lying there covered in a white cloth. Despite hoping it wasn't true, Rimuru couldn't deny the reality before him Xian was gone. Gada, overwhelmed with grief, cried out for Xian, while Rimuru struggled to comprehend what had happened. Xian had sacrificed herself to protect a child during the attack, leaving Gabta to mourn her loss. Rimuru felt a deep sense of sadness and anger, questioning the decisions that led to this tragedy. Unable to find any answers or solace, Rimuru felt a crack appear on his mask, symbolizing his overwhelming sorrow. As night fell, Rimuru stared at the moon, searching for guidance in the midst of his despair, but found none. Three days passed with Xi'an still unconscious, and Rimuru struggled to accept the reality of her loss. He longed for her presence and the companionship of Gabzo, who was also gone. Rimuru realized the deep connections he shared with all the monsters in his town, feeling a sense of despair at their deaths. As dark emotions consumed him, he received a message from the Great Sage about the compound barrier and the possibility of cancelling its magic. Despite being preoccupied with grief, Rimuru recognized the urgency of the situation and reassured Sawai, who had been worried about him. So I informed Rimuru about the enemy encampments surrounding the town, prompting Rimuru to prioritize the safety of his allies over reckless actions. Rimuru also searched for a way to resurrect the dead but found no viable solution, eventually accepting the reality of their deaths and preparing to lay them to rest. However, as he made this decision, Rimuru sensed approaching figures. 
Rimuru awaited the arrival of Cabal and his friends who had traveled tirelessly to reach him. Though they expressed uncertainty about their words, Ellen shared tales of fairy tales involving resurrection, sparking hope in Rimuru's heart. However, he faced challenges in finding a method to bring back the deceased, despite exploring various magical avenues. Yet, learning about the potential of evolving into a demon lord offered a glimmer of possibility. Rimuru pondered the implications, realizing the sacrifices it would entail. Meanwhile, Ellen revealed her background and expressed her desire to aid Rimuru's cause, even if it meant abandoning her adventurer lifestyle. Cabal and Guido, her loyal companions, readily supported her decision. Rimuru accepted their assistance, acknowledging the potential consequences of his actions. With a newfound plan in mind, Rimuru prepared to confront the approaching enemy forces and save his fallen friends within four days. Rimuru's decision set things in motion quickly. First, he strengthened the town's barrier to preserve the souls of his fallen companions, using powerful magic he had analyzed. Despite the hefty cost in magicules, Rimuru felt relieved and hopeful compared to his previous despair. Calling for a conference to discuss future plans, Rimuru assured Cabal, Ellen, and Guido of his improved state. Meanwhile, he approached Yom's team to address Emjuran's situation, stunning them with his decision. Rimuru then revealed his plan to fake Emjuran's death, using her to deceive an enemy demon lord. Though initially shocked, Yom and Grusith reluctantly accepted, knowing the importance of the mission. Rimuru then tasked Yom with a crucial role in reforming Pharmacy's government after defeating their army, aiming for peace and cooperation. Heading towards the meeting hall with Yom, Rimuru found his people gathered, eager to discuss plans for resurrecting Shion and others. Expressing his regret for leaving them, Rimuru sparked hope by proposing the resurrection. Seeking input on dealing with Pharmacy and humans, Rimuru received varied opinions but emphasized the importance of not judging all humans based on the actions of a few. As acknowledging his past as a human, Rimuru outlined his vision of cooperation between monsters and humans, but stressed the need for strength to gain recognition and ensure safety. Despite some skepticism, Rimuru's ideals resonated with his followers, who pledged their loyalty and support. As discussions concluded, Rimuru expressed gratitude and acknowledged his responsibility to lead, receiving affirmation from all present, both monster and human alike. Getting ready to tackle the invasion, the group learned about the enemy's force and strategy. With about 20,000 invaders approaching, they needed a plan. Benamaru offered to take on the main enemy force, while the rest would attack the magical devices maintaining the barrier around town. However, Rimuru had a different idea he wanted to face the invaders alone to become a demon lord, needing to defeat 10,000 foes, Despite concerns, everyone agreed to his plan. Rimuru assigned tasks to his allies, focusing on taking down the magical devices and preparing a replacement barrier to protect the souls of their friends. Benamaru marched confidently towards the magical device to the east, catching the attention of the temple knights guarding it. With his sword ablaze, he swiftly defeated the knights and destroyed the device. Meanwhile, Gobble and his Dragonote warriors launched a surprise attack from the south, overwhelming the Temple Knights with their strength and tactics. As chaos ensued, Gabble engaged in a fierce battle with the Knights' captain, turning the tide in their favor. In the north, Soai and his team executed a stealthy assault, eliminating the enemy commander and spreading fear among the troops. Recognizing the true threat lay in the west, Soai's suspicions were confirmed when they encountered no significant resistance. The magic-producing machine on the hill west of town was guarded by Temple Knights, who felt quite relaxed compared to their counterparts. Shogo and Kiyoya, among them, were eager for action, anticipating the arrival of travelers fleeing down the nearby highway. Shogo especially was excited at the prospect of using his skills to evolve further. However, after three days, no one had shown up, testing Shogo's patience. Suddenly, they received a report of enemies approaching Hakuro, Rieger, Gapta, and Geld. Gapta's surprise attack caused chaos among the knights, but they quickly regrouped, Rieger and Gabba's teamwork disrupted the knight's formation, allowing Geld to unleash a powerful earth shatter kick. As they fought, Shogo eagerly joined the fray, intoxicated by the sensation of power as his enemies fell. Despite Gabba's anger towards him for Gabzo's death, the plan to let Geld face off against Shogo unfolded as intended, and they clashed in a fierce battle. Amidst the chaos, Hakuro and Kiyoya faced off, exchanging taunts and challenges. Kiyoya, Using his severer skill, attempted to outwit Hakuro with a fake sword, 
But Hakuro easily saw through the deception and countered Kyoya's attack. Infuriated, Kyoya unleashed his full power, only to find himself outmatched by Hakuro's prowess. Despite Kyoya's best efforts, Hakuro effortlessly dodged his attacks and ultimately delivered a fatal blow. As Kyoya lay dying, Hakuro reflected on the situation and executed him with precision, proving his superiority. Kyoya's demise served as a reminder of the consequences of underestimating one's opponent. Shogo was furious as his attacks seemed ineffective against Geld, who stood strong with his shield. Despite Shogo's complaints, Geld remained steadfast in his principles of battle. Shogo managed to break Geld's shield with relentless strikes from his berserker skill, but Geld quickly replaced it. Undeterred, Shogo unleashed his full power, enhancing his body with berserker's effects. However, Geld countered with Chaos Eater, causing Shogo intense pain and rendering him helpless. As Shogo writhed in agony, Geld prepared to deliver the final blow. Meanwhile, Hakuro revealed Kyoya's fate, sending Shogo into a panic. Desperate, Shogo fled, hoping to find help from another other world or nearby. As Shogo barged into the tent, he found Carrera lounging inside. Ignoring her confusion, Shogo attacked her, choking her with his bare hands until she succumbed. Memories of her past life flashed before Carrera's eyes as she faced her end. Meanwhile, Hakuro and Geld arrived, witnessing Shogo's heinous act. Suddenly, Shogo unlocked a new power, Survivor, which granted him incredible regeneration abilities. Ignoring their disgust, Shogo boasted about his newfound invincibility, unaware of the consequences. Geld challenged him to a bare-handed fight, overpowering Shogo with relentless attacks fueled by his Chaos Eater skill. Despite Shogo's pleas for mercy, Geld continued his assault until Shogo's spirit was broken. When Geld about a final blow, a mysterious man appeared in front of them. It's Raisin from Famous. As Shogo sought refuge behind Raisin, the court sorcerer, Geld and Hakuro approached, but Raisin swiftly erected a magic barrier to shield them from attack. Recognizing their formidable opponents, Raisin initiated a teleportation spell to retreat, showcasing his mastery of magic. Despite Geld's urge to pursue, Hakuro cautioned against it, as Raisin had set a trap within the barrier. As they conversed, Raisin vanished with Shogo, leaving behind a warning of a greater threat to come. Hakuro, sensing the danger of Raisin's hidden magic, chose to prioritize safety over confrontation. After safely returning with Shogo, Raisin felt a wave of fatigue from casting multiple powerful spells. Despite this, he focused on his next task, reassuring Shogo of his value while secretly plotting his demise. Offering to help Shogo rest, Raisin cast an illusion spell to destroy his spirit, paving the way for his own possession of Shogo's body. Meanwhile, Fulgen observed the events and discussed the egotistical nature of their summoners, finding amusement in their failures. Raisin completed the possession spell, transferring his soul into Shogo's body and feeling rejuvenated by his newfound strength. Confident in his abilities, Raisin set off to report to the king, harboring ambitions to challenge even the strongest foes. However, a lingering suspicion about a potential threat gave him pause before he continued on his path, determined to overcome any obstacle in his way. As the sun hung high in the sky, Ramuru Tempest observed the nightmare unfolding for the kingdom of Pharmus. A legion of troops marched towards them, unaware of the impending danger. Floating in midair, with wings spread and a mask on, Ramuru prepared to unleash destruction upon the invading forces. With magical barriers destroyed and a sorcerer encountered, it was time to act. Deploying a powerful magic circle, Rimuru sealed off the area, preventing any escape. Then, with a spell called Megiddo Rays of Light rained down, swiftly eliminating the knights below without a chance to react. It was a swift and deadly attack, ensuring no survivors remained. In this world, military forces usually use magical barriers to protect themselves from various magical attacks. These barriers, called Legion Magic, are designed to block different types of magic and give the force a heads up against any magical threats. Pharmus, knowing they were marching towards a nation of powerful monsters, had prepared thoroughly for such situations. However, none of their preparations mattered against Rimuru's new magic. Rimuru realized that barriers work by blocking the flow of magicules, the tiny magical particles. He figured out that if he created a pure form of physical energy, it could bypass these barriers, as they were designed to block magical attacks. With insights from previous experiences and the help of the Great Sage, Ramuru developed a powerful magic spell capable of piercing through any type of defensive barrier, regardless of its strength or type. 
Rimuru had summoned over a thousand water droplets and shaped them into large convex lenses to focus sunlight into thin, searing rays. With his magic, he manipulated these water elementals to gather and refract sunlight, creating deadly beams of light. The first blast of light struck down over a thousand knights causing chaos among their ranks. Ramuru effortlessly adjusted the positions of the droplets for a second attack, resulting in another wave of casualties. What made this magic terrifying was its low energy cost and efficiency. Rimuru could quickly rebuild the vaporized lenses using water elementals, allowing him to launch continuous strikes. As the massacre continued, Rimuru targeted the knights with precision, leaving no chance for them to react. In just five minutes, he incapacitated two-thirds of the force, claiming over 10,000 lives. With the enemy weakened, Rimuru descended to Earth, ready to deliver further devastation. When Raizen saw the anti-magic area created by the enemy, he was surprised by its size but quickly realized it wouldn't affect their defensive spells. Unlike the Dwarven Kingdom, Pharmus relied more on defensive magic rather than offense, so the anti-magic area didn't pose a major threat to them. As the enemy's light beams struck down their troops, panic ensued, and soldiers fell one after another. Despite their efforts to maintain order, the knights couldn't withstand the relentless attacks. The leader of the Pharmus mercenary brigades regretted joining the expedition as his forces were decimated. The Temple Knights attempted to form defensive barriers, but were swiftly killed. Even the magicians among the Noble Knight Federation were helpless in the face of the onslaught. Raisin and Fulgen decided to regroup with their king, hoping to find safety amidst the chaos. As they hurried to the king's tent, they shouted for his whereabouts, desperate to ensure his safety. King Edmaris struggled to contain his fear as chaos reigned around him. With each wave of light beams decimating his forces, he realized the campaign was a failure, and escape seemed impossible. Huddled inside his tent with Archbishop Rahim, they witnessed the devastation outside. Desperate to survive, the king sought guidance from Knight Captain Fulgen and Shogo, who revealed their plan to retreat using surviving knights as shields. Equipped with winged shoes to aid their escape, they waited for the right moment to flee. As they made their escape, tragedy struck when Fulgen fell to the lethal light beams. Panic consumed the king as he grappled with the sudden turn of events. Outside, they encountered a figure descending from the sky, whom the king recognized as a formidable enemy. Realizing his grave mistake in provoking this adversary, he scrambled to negotiate, clinging to a desperate hope for survival. Once high above the ground, Ramuru looked down on the ruined area, marveling at the destruction they had caused. Despite some doubts, they remained focused on their task. Survivors begged for mercy, but Ramuru swiftly ended their pleas with lethal beams of light. Controlling these beams became effortless, thanks to calculations from the Great Sage. As they pondered their newfound power, Ramuru noticed the approach of a group below, led by Edmaris and Rahim. Edmaris, desperate for negotiation, was met with skepticism and ultimately lost an arm for his audacity. Meanwhile, Rehaim pleaded for mercy, offering to establish friendly relations. Ramuru, irritated by their arrogance, decided to spare Rehahim while testing Edmaris's resolve. Despite Edmaris's attempts to reason, he lost a leg for his trouble. Ramuru then unleashed a skill called Merciless, extinguishing the lives of all who opposed them, even those fleeing. With this power, they initiated their transformation into a true demon lord, solidifying their dominance over the world. As Ramuru's body fell to the ground, turning into a slime, he felt incredibly tired and struggled to stay awake. His magic sense started to fade, making him dizzy and worried he might lose consciousness. Despite his exhaustion, Ramuru sensed a survivor nearby and realized he couldn't rest yet. He urgently called for his friend Ranga to take him back to town, along with two captured individuals. Ramuru instructed Ranga to ensure their safety and to deal with the survivor cautiously. He summoned demons to aid in capturing the survivor, hoping to buy some time before he could rest. As his fatigue grew, Ramuru marveled at the birth of a new demon lord, but could barely comprehend the demon's words before slipping into unconsciousness, marking the beginning of his evolution. After Ramuru left for battle, the town residents gathered in the central plaza, led by Shuna, to maintain the protective barrier. Shuna enhanced the barrier's magic while the stronger residents guarded the town outskirts. Shin and the other victims were laid to rest in the middle of the plaza, near a throne prepared for Ramuru's evolution ceremony. The townspeople surrounded the area, hoping that performing the ceremony near the victims would increase their chances of revival. Shuna felt a deep connection to Ramuru and feared losing him, 
while Benamaru worried about Rimuru's transformation into a demon lord and its impact on their lives. With the barrier completed, everyone prayed for Rimuru's safety. Upon receiving word that Rimuru's harvest festival was about to begin, Benamaru and the others prepared for Rimuru's return, determined to ensure he remained in control of his senses. As Rimuru returned on Ranga's back, Benamaru contemplated the question he would ask Rimuru to confirm his sanity. Rimuru lay in a deep slumber, his consciousness dissolved into an irregular blob without his usual form. In the darkness beyond his awareness, the harvest festival began, reconstructing his body into a new species, the demon slime. His attributes were greatly enhanced, and he gained numerous skills and resistances. The great sage, seeking evolution, repeatedly failed until it sacrificed Deviant and evolved into Raphael, Lord of Wisdom. Despite lacking emotion, it felt fulfilled, tirelessly working to fulfill Rimuru's desires. The evolution continued as Glutton transformed into Belzbeth, Lord of Gluttony. Meanwhile, the festival celebrated Rimuru's evolution into a true demon lord, distributing gifts to all connected to him. As the festivities carried on, the evolution process continued in the depths beyond Rimuru's awareness. Raisin, hiding in fear, watched the chaos unfold. He had died once before, but was brought back to life by Survivor, now armed with Shogo's skills. Despite his desire to save his king, he knew confronting the monstrous foe would be futile. As the enemy wreaked havoc, Raisin stayed hidden, hoping to increase his chances of survival. Witnessing the devastation caused by the enemy, even Raisin, usually resistant to fear, trembled in terror. Realizing his own limitations, he contemplated a kamikaze charge but ultimately decided against it. Suddenly, a large wolf-like monster appeared and rescued King Edmaris and Archbishop Rahim, leaving Raisin facing three greater demons alone. Recognizing the enemy as his master, Raisin devised a plan to summon demons to aid him. However, the spirit he summoned saw Raisin as nothing but prey, rendering his plan futile. With magic negated and facing the powerful demon, Raisin's attempts to fight back failed, leading to his eventual defeat and capture by the demon's minions. As Benamaru and the others watched, Ramaru's body went through various transformations, finally settling into a glowing form. Everyone felt an intense exhaustion, but Benamaru fought it off as he awaited Rimuru's evolution. When the light faded, a taller figure with silver hair stood before them, and a soothing voice instructed them to rest. Meanwhile, Emjuran observed as everyone fell asleep and the magicules in the area were absorbed by Belzebuth under Raphael's command, leaving the town unharmed. Despite the surreal events, Emjuran could only watch in amazement, feeling both disbelief and a sense of caution. As Ranga stood guard at the town entrance, waiting for the demons summoned by Rimuru, Grusith kept him company, chatting to pass the time. They discussed Shuna's impressive magic skills and the barrier she had created, keeping them all inside town. As Grusith admired Shuna's creativity and noticed Emjuran's surprised expression when she learned about it. Meanwhile, Ranga expressed confidence in Rimuru's ability to protect them all. Grukasith also pondered the upcoming Demon Lord evolution and the potential consequences for the balance of power among Demon Lords. Eventually, Ranga succumbed to sleep due to the evolving process, leaving Grukasith to fulfill his duty to protect the town entrance. When the demons summoned by Rimuru arrived, Grukasith greeted them cautiously, guiding them into town. However, as he prepared to enter the town, the barrier suddenly disappeared, prompting him to investigate further, leaving the demons behind. The demon felt a strong presence in the air and instructed his underlings not to harm a man they had found. He then teleported to Rimuru's side marveling at his master's divine aura. Rimuru was performing a complex ritual to revive fallen monsters but lacked enough magicules. The demon suggested using the life force of two greater demons as a substitute, which Rimuru accepted. The greater demons willingly sacrificed themselves, providing the necessary energy for the ritual. The demon admired Rimuru's power and waited quietly, not wanting to interfere with his master's work. As the ritual began, the demon observed from a distance, filled with awe and admiration for Rimuru's evolution into a demon lord. The process began with mysterious, glowing balls that held the souls of the fallen, wrapped in a delicate purple light. With the secret art of resurrection, these souls were restored and returned to their bodies, with a success rate of 3.14%. Thanks to an extra skill gifted to them during their evolution, memories were fully restored, even from damaged brains. As the souls connected with their bodies, 
a pulse of life began to beat within them. It was a divine mystery, a miracle brought about by the prayers of everyone involved. However, to Raphael the one who orchestrated it all, there was no joy in success nor sadness in failure, for he lacked understanding of human emotions. Despite this, a spark of self-awareness emerged within him, questioning his own actions. Yet Raphael continued his precise work, analyzing and resurrecting nearly a hundred souls seamlessly until the miracle was quietly complete. Only three individuals knew the secret of the ceremony Emjurin, Grukasith, and the demon. Emjurin watched in silent shock, her face drained of color, as she witnessed the ultimate secret art unfold before her eyes. She realized the immense power of Rimuru as a demon lord, far surpassing anything she had ever encountered. Grusith, though lacking in magical knowledge, was equally awestruck by the miracle before him, unable to comprehend the sheer magnitude of Rimuru's abilities. He questioned whether Rimuru's kindness was genuine or merely an act, but resolved to never defy him. As for the demon, he was filled with joy and admiration, dismissing any thoughts of his master's unusual behavior as mere overthinking. Instead, he focused on finding ways to serve Rimuru and secure his place by his side. As Rimuru, now known as Raphael, completed his task, he fell back into a deep sleep due to exhaustion. The demon gently placed him on a throne, while Emjurin and the demon speculated on how Rimuru would be once he woke up. Meanwhile, Yom, Cabal, and others rushed over to find the town's monster sleeping. Menjurin explained that Rimuru had evolved into a demon lord and resurrected everyone who had died. However, she warned that their memories might not be intact. As the group discussed what to do next, they realized that the sleeping monsters were starting to wake up on their own. Amidst the chaos, they overlooked the fact that Raphael had developed a sense of self-awareness, quietly shaping events from the shadows. Rimuru woke up feeling refreshed after his evolution, but he quickly realized that things were chaotic around him. He noticed that the monsters around him were stronger now, thanks to his evolution. The Great Sage, now known as Raphael, informed Rimuru about the successful completion of the Harvest Festival, which resulted in everyone evolving further. However, when Rimuru tried to ask for advice, he realized that Raphael was gone. To make matters worse, Benamaru tested Rimuru's memory with a tricky question about Xian's cooking putting him in a difficult situation. Just when things seemed hopeless, Raphael came up with a brilliant answer to save Rimuru from trouble. Despite Benamaru's panic, Rimuru managed to escape Shine's cooking ordeal and watched as Benamaru faced the consequences of his own actions. After Shine left, the recently revived survivors gathered around Rimuru, relieved to see him awake and well. Thanks to Rimuru's complete memory skill, everyone retained their memories and personalities, which was a huge relief. Rimuru reflected on how his evolution effort paid off, granting everyone the ability to keep coming back to life. However, their reunion was cut short when Benamaru informed Rimuru about the arrival of evacuees from the Beast Kingdom of Urizania. Phobio, one of the three lycanthropiers, revealed that Melim had defeated Carillon in battle, causing the Beast Kingdom's downfall. Surprisingly, Frey, another demon lord, had aided Melim, leaving Rimuru puzzled about their alliance. The Lycanthropeers were eager to retaliate against Frey, but Rimuru urged caution and cooperation, stressing the need for more information before taking action. Afterward, they focused on providing aid and accommodations for the exhausted evacuees, deciding to postpone any further plans for the time being. Surrounded by the nice smells from the emergency kitchens, everyone braced themselves for Shine's cooking with a mix of fear and hope. Benamaru, looking nervous, pleaded not to be left alone during dinner, while Rimuru reluctantly agreed to join him at the table. Xian, beaming with pride, served up her dishes, which looked questionable at best. Rimuru couldn't hide his shock at the sight of the unappetizing stew-like concoction before him, and he scolded Xian for her lack of culinary skills. Benamaru, unable to cope with the situation, admitted defeat, while Xian revealed her wish for cooking mastery during Rimuru's evolution, resulting in her new skill, Master Chef, which made her dishes taste better than they looked. Despite the initial skepticism, Rimuru and Benamaru were pleasantly surprised by the taste of the food, leading to a festive atmosphere as everyone celebrated the town's revival. The night turned into a joyful party, with laughter and merriment filling the air. As the festivities continued, Rimuru reflected on the challenges ahead, including the Beast Kingdom refugees, the rescue of Carillon and relations with the Western Holy Church. However, for now, they decided to enjoy the moment and celebrate with the newly established Tempest Resurrection Festival, a yearly tradition in their land. 
Late into the night, while everyone slept off their partying, Ramuru was approached by a stranger who seemed thrilled about his recent evolution into a full-fledged demon lord. Confused, Ramuru asked who the stranger was, only to realize they were a demon he had summoned earlier. Remembering, Ramuru thanked the demon for their help and allowed them to return home. However, the demon expressed a desire to stay and serve Ramuru, which surprised him. Despite not being able to offer a salary, Ramuru agreed, and the demon, named Diablo, was overjoyed. Ramuru then confided in Diablo about his worries regarding the future and the many problems they faced, including dealing with other demon lords and the Western Holy Church. Diablo offered to help manage these problems and proposed discussing a plan with everyone the next day. Rimuru agreed and felt relieved to have Diablo's support. Additionally, they learned that releasing another powerful entity, Vildora, could help keep the Western Holy Church in check. Excited by this revelation, Rimuru decided to take action and become a demon lord in both name and deed, with Diablo and his faithful companion Ranga by his side. The next day, Rimuru gathered all his friends and allies for a big meeting. There were many important people there like Shuna, Xi'an, Rigurd, Gabta, Benamaru, Hakuro, Kaijin, Kurob, Garm, Dold, Geld, Mildo, Lilina, Soai, Soka, Ranga, Yom, Kajil, Rommel, Emjurin, Grukasith, and the three Lycanthropiers. Rimuru introduced Diablo, a strong ally who had helped him before, and promoted Gable to lead the development team. Then, Rimuru shared his plan to become a demon lord and challenged another demon lord named Clayman. His friends agreed to help him. Rimuru gave everyone important tasks to do, like negotiating with other nations, gathering information and preparing for battle. Everyone promised to work hard, and Rimuru thanked them before they all got to work. After the meeting, only Diablo, Shuna, and Rimuru were left in the room. Rimuru had given orders to Xi'an, who was supposed to interrogate some prisoners. Xi'an was really strict with Diablo, trying to explain what being a secretary meant, but Diablo didn't really listen. Meanwhile, Xi'an was torturing the prisoners she had been given to interrogate. Rimuru allowed her to do whatever she wanted to make them talk, as long as she didn't physically hurt them. Rimuru felt less angry now that everyone was safe, so they didn't feel the need to harm the prisoners themselves. He thought it might be better to keep the prisoners alive for now, in case they could be useful later. While Xi'an was busy with the prisoners, Rimuru had other things to do.he wanted to learn about how countries handle things after a war. So he asked Vester about it. Then he learned a lot and decided to ask for help with their plans. They also talked about what to do with prisoners of war, but there weren't many clear answers. Rimuru thanked Vester for their help and allowed them to report back. As Vester left, Rimuru wondered if they were acting strange because of them. They hoped everything would be okay. After Vester left, Raphael informed Rimuru that the analysis of unlimited imprisonment was complete. Rimuru decided to go to the sealed cave alone to release Veldora. Using spatial motion, Rimuru easily reached the cave where Veldora was held. Rimuru had evolved into a demon lord, gaining new skills like Mind Accelerate and Belzebuth. With Raphael's help, Rimuru was more powerful than ever. After freeing Veldora, they discussed their new abilities and caught up on things. Rimuru then created a duplicate body for Veldora to inhabit and made a promise with him. However, Raphael revealed a surprising development as Soul Corridor was established between Rimuru and Veldora, granting Rimuru access to Veldora's powers. This news left Rimuru shocked and Veldora excited. With the connection established, Veldora's duplicate body transformed into a more masculine form, and he expressed his joy at being fully restored. Despite some confusion over memories, they celebrated Veldora's freedom. Veldora struggled to control his aura, so Rimuru gave him some tips. After meditating, Veldora managed to shrink his aura. Rimuru joked about Veldora's newfound knowledge from manga. Despite some confusion, they moved on. Raphael informed Rimuru about the new skills gained from the monsters in the town. Rimuru decided to simplify the skills for easier use. Then, Raphael revealed that Rimuru's skill, Unlimited Imprisonment, had evolved into Uriel, Lord of Vows. Rimuru was surprised but felt reassured by the new power. They went over the features of the skill, which included defense, control, and movement abilities. Rimuru felt invincible but reminded himself to stay cautious. Meanwhile, Veldora mastered controlling his aura and discovered his new skill Faust, Lord of Investigation. With their preparations complete, Veldora was ready to explore the outside world after centuries of being sealed over 300 years. As Rimuru and Veldora emerged from the cave, 
They found a crowd of people waiting anxiously. Some wanted to rush into the cave to rescue Ramuru, while others insisted on waiting for Ramuru's orders. Benamaru tried to calm the situation, explaining that Rimuru must have a reason for being in the cave and they shouldn't interfere. Rimuru realized that three whole days had passed since he entered the cave, causing concern among the lycanthropes. Veldora, now in human form, was introduced to the crowd, causing a stir. At that moment the Dryads showed and paid their respect for Veldora, and Rimuru explained that he had helped Veldora control his aura. Meanwhile, Sawai arrived with news about Clayman's activities, prompting Rimuru to call for a town meeting to discuss the future of Tempest and deal with their enemies. With newfound power and determination, Rimuru smiled at the prospect of justice prevailing. Clayman was furious as his plans kept falling apart. His schemes to cause chaos and awaken as a true demon lord were failing, but he found a glimmer of hope in Milam's victory over Carolyn. With Frey's help, he manipulated Milam into taking out Carolyn, securing her allegiance. Despite setbacks like losing his agent Perone, Clayman saw an opportunity to pit the Western Holy Church against Rimuru and Prophet from their conflict. He laughed at the thought of his lifelong dream finally becoming reality, eager to report back to his B. That's it for today guys, and thank for watching the video, stay tuned for next chapter. Until then, goodbye.